Today's workplace podcast disclaimer, JT Wilson. This podcast is intended to provide general information about various recent developments in employment law and human resources best practices. Nothing in this presentation or in the comments of Ms. Johnson, Ms. Shannon, or any guest should be considered as the rendering of legal or other professional advice and it is not directed at any specific cases or circumstances. Listeners are responsible for obtaining the necessary advice about their specific situations from their own counsel. These materials are intended for educational and informational purposes only. The presentation and these materials represent the opinions of the participants and not those of their law firms or companies. No part of these materials may be printed, photocopied, or otherwise reproduced, recorded, or stored, or transmitted in any form and by any means, electronic, mechanical, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of today's Workplace Podcast. Welcome to today's Workplace, a podcast created to keep employers current on the latest employment law trends while providing proactive solutions to the everyday issues arising in today's rapidly changing workplace. Is your business prepared for today's workplace? Let's find out with your hosts, Barbara Johnson and Belinda Reed Shannon. You know, there's been a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and the impact of artificial intelligence on the workplace. In fact, the idea that um, none of us will have any jobs because all of our jobs will be done by robots or through artificial intelligence. So you're the futurist. Tell us about what the future holds in terms of artificial in- intelligence and the impact on today's workplace and tomorrow's workplace. Yeah, so artificial intelligence is interesting uh, because we're learning and growing as it learns and grows. So I think it was Warren Bennis, and I hope I get his quote right, who said that the factory of the future will only have two employees. There'll be a man and there'll be a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog and the dog will be there to make sure the man doesn't touch anything because it's gonna run continuously. You know, there's the commercial on TV that I love where the elevator repair man shows up at the front desk and says, I'm here to fix the elevator. And the security guard at the front desk looks at his paper and says, there's nothing here saying you're supposed to fix the elevator today. And so, and he said, no, the elevator called me <laughs> because the artificial intelligence knew that the elevator was going to be needing repairs. So he called the repair man. They called the repair man. The elevator did to come and fix the elevator. So there's a lot of good things that can be done with artificial intelligence and machine learning, but we are learning. There are still, there's law cases now against artificial intelligence with cars where, you know, somebody got hurt with Mm -hmm. a self-driving car and tried to sue the artificial intelligence over it. They lost the case, but it's, it's a growing part of the legal system now that Think of artificial intelligence as something you can actually sue. There, you know, there's the famous story from Microsoft. I love Microsoft, by the way. We do a lot of work with them. We do a lot of case studies with them. They're a great company, great culture. Uh, And they believe in this growth mindset kind of culture where you grow from, you learn from your mistakes and you grow when you learn from, you discuss them. A lot of companies do this. Uh, Some call them failure Fridays, where you discuss all your failures and what you learn from them, et cetera. But they had, they develop a bot with artificial intelligence that would answer questions from consumers. Well, quickly, within minutes, consumers knew that this was artificial intelligence. And so they started feeding it racist and misogynistic stuff. Oh, yeah. And Tay ended up spouting out misogynistic and racist things back to them as answers. And they had to pull the plug within the hour. And, you know, Sate and Adela, who was the CEO, wrote a very famous email about, we're going to learn from this. We apologize to our customers. We apologize to everybody, but we'll learn from it. Here's another good example of artificial intelligence in a mall that you could go up to and ask questions. Where's the food court? Where's Macy's? Where's, you know, whatever. And teenagers will be teenagers. And so they started feeding it all kinds of junk. 
racist, misogynistic, all kinds of things. And so the little old lady would go up to the robot and say, where's the food for it? And the robot would just spout all kinds of four letter words at her as she was given directions to the food court. So they had to get rid of the robot. So we're learning because artificial intelligence will learn. We had a lot of experimenting with recruiting using artificial intelligence and face recognition and things like that. Not so much because uh, unconscious bias is unconscious bias. And unless you know you have it, you're going to give it to artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and it will automatically do, you know, predictive analytics is the same way. If you're trying to recruit a more diverse and inclusive workforce and you use all the data from the past to create models for your recruiting, well, all your data from the past was white male data. So what do you right. think the artificial intelligence tells you to do? Hire more white males. It doesn't really give you the data you need to do predictive analytics of how you would actually go about hiring a more diverse and inclusive workforce. So we've got a ways to learn. It has great potential. When you look at the World Economic Forum report, which came out last year and went from 2020 to 2025 in their predictions, Almost all the top 20 jobs had to do with technology. And they predicted that 50% of employees would have to be upskilled and reskilled for the workforce mm -hmm. in the future by 2025, uh, just to meet the needs of the technology in the past. So we're wow. still going to need employees, but with different skills. Can you expound a little bit more on that um, when you say... Um, upskilling, have they been specific about what those skills look like or, you know, just the general categories? Well, a lot of them is general categories, correct. They're, you know, they have general categories of different kinds of technology and engineering that will be needed in the future. And it's needed today. We have, we don't have enough people graduating with STEM degrees and mm -hmm. we, we need more. And the education system isn't prepared to do that. Um, so a lot of it's falling on companies to realize where are the talent gaps we have? Where are our, where are our risks going forward? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how can we mitigate those risks going forward? I, I have a, a great story at Disney. So at Disney, they needed coders. And especially they wanted female coders. That's not a big thing that comes out of college, okay? Right. So how do you get female coders? Well, they came up with a program called Code Rosie. And what they did is that the female coders that they did have formed a group where they would train current employees, females, to be coders. And mm -hmm. anybody could apply for it. It was a very, I think it was a six-month program, if I'm right. And you could apply for it, any female, and these female coders would be the teachers. And the first three months was intense training on how to be a coder. The last three months was on the job training with coders. It was called Code Rosie. Um, and it was very rigorous. The nice thing about it is that if you didn't make it, in other words, if you were not cut out to be a coder and you mm -hmm. volunteered for it, you did not lose your job. You can go back to your old job, okay? So yeah. a, there was a guarantee built into it. Low but risk. It, it was very low risk. So the CHRO went to the CEO after one year of the program and was, was afraid, you know, they're going to cut my budget. I'm not going to be able to do it again. And went to the CEO and the CEO says, I'm not cutting your budget. I'm doubling it. It's just so successful. And so... A lot of programs, a lot of companies are taking upon themselves to really make this happen. You look at conductors, engineers, and railroads, okay? BNSF, you probably never heard of them. They're a big, huge thing. They train high school graduates to be engineers and conductors. It's a very rigorous program, wow. but they're part of the 110 Coalition. You know about the 110 Coalition? They're part I, of I have heard of that you know, yeah. companies that have committed to something? Yeah, so they're going to have 1 million more diverse people in mm -hmm. high-tech engineering jobs 
in the next 10 years. Yeah. A million or something, I forget the goal. But they hire them and they train them themselves. And it's a long, it's a long-term investment in a person's growth. And you don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to have a science degree. They will chain train you to be a conductor. So companies are taking upon themselves to do it. There's a DEI consortium of CEOs that my partner, Kevin Oaks, is part of, and we do the research for them. So it's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of good things that happen, but there's two steps forward and one step back all the time. Yeah. When, you, when you look at all the pledges that have been made uh, by companies after Black Lives Movement, most companies made a lot of pledges. In fact, one CHRO told me, my CEO, I'm trying to convince my CEO, if he wanted to meet his pledge, he has to hire 100% African-American people for the next five years. <laughs> you know, because they've been so bad at it in the past. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The problem is, although 75% of companies make pledges, only about 28% say they're making progress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening and a lot of stuff that's not happening at the same time. Right. It was um, was so interesting to hear your your background the t- about the time that you spent in Southeast Asia, and the probably unique perspective that you have on globalization as a result of that to some extent. What does the future hold in terms of globalization and the the movement that we've we've seen with respect to globalization? You know, we had this big push toward globalization. And then there was this retreat to local. And now, I mean, are we going to go back to global? What's, what's the story with globalization? No, there's this constant trend between the trend and the counter, trying to tension between the trend and the counter trend. So globalization versus nationalization. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing this happening today. You've seen it happen for the last five years. There's a lot of you know, people who have been left behind in a country tend to want to be more nationalistic. Let's do more for our country rather than be more global. And people who are the haves tend to be more global, be citizens of the world. So where are we going? I don't think we can get away from being a global society. We are getting smaller. Friedman wrote a book called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. And the, the, uh, the co- concept of the book is the Lexus is a symbol of our globalization. You can find a Lexus everywhere in the world. They're made everywhere in the world, unless you go to China and they're all Buicks. But anyway, <laughs> there's just, uh, it, it's the global thing. The olive tree is that thing in our backyard that is our culture that we want to hold on to with dear life. So we want to be global, but we also want to be local. And you see us, even in the United States, uh, even though we become more global, even though people are more global, we tend to cocoon within our cultural comfort zone even more than ever before. Hmm. So uh, I'm a white male. I can raise my white kids in a white neighborhood. I can send them to a white school. They can go to college and maybe involved in diversity, but they don't have to be. Then they go into corporate world and you're taught you to value diversity uh, and, and inclusion, but mm-hmm. then you go home to your white neighborhood again. So the only place where we're being taught to really value diversity and inclusion is, is in at work. work. Is at work. We all are mm-hmm. cocooning within a cultural comfort zone. And that goes for most ethnic groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though my wife is a different ethnicist than I am, she tends to cocoon with people who are more like her mm-hmm. uh, than my friends. So it's 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 an interesting dynamic that even though we're global, and I my wife considers herself a citizen of the world too. Yeah, uh, we've traveled. We traveled a lot, but we still cocoon within our cultural comfort zone. So it's t- tension. Yeah. So are you are you talking about that from like the American perspective and experience, or 
do you see that same tension and dynamic in uh, places outside of the United States? And the reason I ask is because, you know, about 10 years ago, I read an international diversity report that, you know, it was an index that measured uh, different aspects of diversity in different parts of the world. And in, in, the, in the case I was specifically looking at, because I worked for a British company, it showed that in the UK, they were more accepting of diversity socially and less accepting of it in the workplace. But in the US, we were more accepting of it in the workplace and less accepting of it socially. And that kind of mirrors yeah. exactly what you just said about how we cocoon at home outside yeah. of work, but we in, at work are actually taught about diversity. And so we learn more about it in the work context. It's, it's interesting. Europe is very uh, non-inclusive. So you look at France, you look at England, you look at Germany, it's very non-inclusive there. We have, how can I say, in the United States, we have unique kind of country where you can come here and you can be an American overnight. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the broad spectrum of things, we are a very diverse, inclusive society, even though we cocoon within our cultural comfort zone more and more. But in other parts of the world, it's not so much. Mm -hmm. So you cannot go to England and be a British person overnight. Mm -hmm. You can't go to France and be French overnight. You can't go to Japan and be Japanese overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, you can come to the United States and be an American overnight. Uh, and there's a lot of more cocooning in some of the richer cultures like Japanese or like French or, and things like that than there is in the United States. It's, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, which is changing, it's changing very yeah. slowly, but it is changing. I never heard so many stereotype jokes than I went when I was living in Europe. I spent about a year living in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And the jokes that the people in Netherlands used to talk about the French and the French, they talk about the Germans and the Germans talk about the Italians. And, mm -hmm. and I, wow, how can you say those things? I mean, it's just, you know, that's yeah. unbelievable. Anyway, it's, uh, it, it's there everywhere. It, it's something we got to overcome. I'm going to say something probably that's going to give me some backlash. But today you see I'm Polish. Mm -hmm. and I'm very proud of Poland bringing in all these immigrants from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And Hungary and Moldavia and the rest of those countries. They didn't bring in Syrians. They didn't bring in Africans, mm. but they brought in Ukrainians. Tell me why. Very good question. The way in perhaps the way we answer that question would be very different than how they would answer that question, don't you think? Yeah, probably. But the optics are there for anybody yes. who wants to look at them. Yeah. And we'll bring in Ukrainians, but we won't let the we won't let Mexicans cross the border. You you have a point there. <laughs> I know I'm going to get some pushback on that one. <laughs> You're going to get a reaction. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> good observation. And I, and I apologize for the that. Very good. So very good. So offended. Very very perceptive. I think mm -hmm. observation. Let's put it that way. But I got to say, the world is getting better. The way the world has reacted to the Russian invasion is something you didn't see when they did that to Syria or they did to Georgia. Um, right. But you're seeing a coalition that is building that I'm kind of proud of the way countries have come together against this invasion of Ukraine. So. Um, yeah. We're, we're getting better, I think. Yeah. Let's turn back to um, corporate America for a moment. Um, when we think about corporate America, the concept of corporations as um, we know them today, a lot of that developed after World War II and is based on a very hierarchical approach, kind of like the military. 
um, you know, you have the CEO and then you have the, the VPs and the directors and the managers. Um, does leadership, what do you think leadership looks, is look, going to look like in the um, near future and the longer term? Yeah, that's a great question um, because we did a study on that um, uh, at the end of the pandemic to say how leadership behavior has changed. And we really weren't looking at CEO or the executive suite. We were looking at managers and first line supervisors, people who manage teams during the pandemic. The ones that were successful, what were their behaviors like and how did it shift? And we wanted to know which behaviors were correlated with the market performance of the company, with productivity, with healthy culture, with innovation, with creativity. So we had a lot of what we call dependent variables built into the study. And what we found that the best leaders, and we call them people leaders, changed. And we saw that a lot of companies who saw these people leaders be successful, whether it with the culture or the productivity or the market performance, et cetera, start teaching other leaders how to be these new people leaders. And so there were a few things that they exhibited. One is, was the well-being of their workforce, of their teams. They became more humane. They listened more. They cared more about the well-being of their people, especially as the pandemic drew on and we saw it wear and break people. More managers of these people leaders were more concerned about the well-being. They were more transparent over these Zoom calls and everything. We couldn't meet in offices. We couldn't meet in conference rooms. So the better people leaders became more transparent in their communication, more mm -hmm. honest in their communication. They were more understanding. I remember we had tons of what we call Zoominars around the pandemic. And you know, we would have hundreds of companies all exchanging ideas on what worked and what didn't work, et cetera, because we were all thrown into this right away. One of the things that really worked were managers who understood what people were going through. I could look now into your house. I could see how you live. I became more understanding of the pet that just walked across the keyboard. The children who would interrupt the meetings become laughter rather than irritants. Surveying their team to find out what their schedules were like during the day, when they had to homeschool, when they had to do this, when they had that, so they could schedule their team meetings around the individual's lifestyles that they had to go through. So it was a lot more understanding with these people leaders. They were much more agile. They moved quickly. They had a more of a digital mindset. All of a sudden, you had to know about technology. Even me, at my age, I learned about technology and became proficient at it. Not as proficient as some of the young people in my company, but yeah, I did my duty and became had a digital mindset. They became developers of talent. And I think this is a key one for leaders of the future to be developers of talent, to be coaches, teachers, or mentors, and really understand what it means to develop talent. And we saw that years ago when we did uh, talent management in the trenches study. And we found that developers of talent managers were well away above everybody else. And they were very concerned about all of a sudden with everything that was going on socially with DEI. And one of the things we saw as a behavior with the better ones, and I got to remember what it was specifically, I'm going to get it wrong. They form productive relationships with people who were different than them. I mean, so talk about cocooning. Yeah. Not, and so they actually went out of their way to form productive relationships with people who were different than them. So there was a lot of characteristics that really bloomed with these people leaders, what I call people leaders, not CEOs or exec team, but those managers of teams uh, did during the pandemic that I'm hoping are going to be key attributes for them to be successful going forward. I think we've learned some things about what a good team leader manager is, and that's a good people leader. 
The problem is, is right now we're not measuring and rewarding good people leaders. Mm -hmm. For it to be sustainable, we have to learn how to measure it. We have to train for it, first of all. Then we'd have to learn how to measure it. Then we have to learn how to reward it or recognize it when it works well and punish people when it doesn't work well. We haven't made that leap. We haven't jumped that shark yet. And I think that's the next thing that companies should be thinking about doing is how do we measure, how do we train, how do we measure, how do we recognize good people leaders? That's a really strong and good profile that you just provided us of people, leaders of the future. I think most companies would really understand the message that they need to start building those type of leaders now. Yeah. I don't think we're finished with chaos in society. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're going to still need, need these people leaders in the future. We go from the pandemic to World War III. Give me a break. It's, stuff's not going to stop happening. Well, Jay, we could continue speaking with you for another hour and another 40 topics. <laughs> it's also very, very interesting. And then we'll just, just have uh, to have him back. That's no, exactly, no problem. Exactly, Absolutely. Then we'd want to circle back to about that time you were going through Southeast Asia. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <in there. laughs> another but, um, thing that we may want to talk about in the future is this whole purpose, culture, and brand. Yes. Uh, we don't have time right now, but it is a huge issue today to align yeah. your purpose, your culture, and your brand as a company uh, yeah. if you're going to attract the best and the brightest. Well, I think we have our next episode with Jay <laughs> Adrog, um, because one of the questions that we didn't get to is how do organizations create culture? You know, the way that we've done it historically doesn't necessarily work today. And so this idea of tying that to, to brand is really fascinating. So I think we have our next episode think, with Jay Jamrock. I think so too. I think <laughs> you brought it up, Jay. Big, so we, yeah, we, we did a huge it. study. We got a book called Culture Renovation written by Kevin Oakes uh, that's based on our research and our study. It's a bestseller. It's in its fifth printing. So we can do a lot of talking just on it. Yeah. It's called Ultra Renovations. Culture renovation. Culture. It's renovation. not transformation or change, it's renovation. So we got, saw the okay. companies that were successful were actually renovating, not trying to change, not trying to transform, but actually renovating, just like. Interesting. Yeah. Good kind of interesting. This, this has been so incredibly interesting, Jay, and I'd like to thank you for taking time with us today on today's workplace. Yeah. Well, I thank you for the invitation, and I'd be glad to come back anytime. Oh, thank you. We will look forward to having you again. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Today's Workplace with Barbara Johnson and Belinda Reed Shannon. If you like what you heard, click subscribe so you don't miss out on future updates and episodes.